Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm privileged to be able to speak on this motion given that over a quarter million seniors are living in poverty today, and also to articulate the importance of today's youth to be engaged in the dialogue to, to uphold the standards for today's seniors, but also for those seniors who are going to be coming in the future, whether it's the, re the near future or for people like me, the distant future. This is a crisis that, we, that we're facing today with the number of seniors who are living in poverty that, we're, that demands immediate attention. This government has a responsibility to act now to lift every senior out of poverty. According to, to Statistics Canada, almost 300,000 more Ontarians sunk into poverty since 2007. Further, Ontario's 17% growth in poverty since 2007 was the highest in the country. So right now, almost 1.7 million Ontarians are living in poverty. Poverty has increased by almost 20% among working age adults and a staggering, get ready for this, 42% among seniors in Ontario. I hear the distress and the anxiety from my constituents, unsure how they're going to be able to pay for the increasing energy and food costs and the additional taxes on their expenses as a result of the HST. Talking with some of the constituents on this very issue, I remember speaking with an elderly couple who lived in the Alton Towers buildings in my, in my riding. They had no heat. They invited me into their home, but they had no heat on. They had one portable space heater that they moved from room to room to room as they moved. They didn't have any of their big lights on in, the, in their houses. They had only small lamps on. They didn't watch TV, and they had one radio that they used for entertainment. They were doing everything possible, everything that they could think of to reduce their consumption so that they could reduce their expenditures. But I sat with them for about 20 minutes as they went through their bills. They were showing me their hydro bills that were consistently getting more and more expensive and less and less affordable for them to live and to have go through their regular day-to-day -day expenses for just living, not in a, any fancy way, in the meager way that they were living. Nobody in Canada deserves to be living like this. Nobody deserves to be living in these conditions, especially not our seniors who have given so much of their lives for us and they've invested into the system for so much of their lives only to be treated and to have to live in such abhorrent conditions. No senior deserves to be lining up at a food bank in order to feed themselves or to be, for, or to be forced to work well into their retirement years. Another couple I spoke with on Burner Trail, not too far from where I live, moved into their modest home as a young couple. They worked very hard and raised their family there too. They'd played by the book, and done everything right to be able to enjoy their so-called golden years. <coughs> However, now, at the ages of 67 and 65, they are looking for work they are looking for any type of work they could get to help pay for their expenses. The woman is actually working at the Food Basics by my house as a grocery clerk to be able to pay for their expenses at 65. A 2009 report on the woman's poverty from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives states that low income rates among senior women remain almost double that of the senior men. We know from Statistics Canada that women in, Canada, in Canadian society live longer lives than men. Mr. Speaker, I am concerned, as everyone here in this House, in this Parliament should be, for all the single senior women in my constituency and in Canada who are going to be left with no choice but to be dependent on the food bank and the kindness of the local community members because it is clear, it is very clear from this government's budget that lifting every senior out of poverty is not their priority. The $300 million proposed by this government 
It's nice, you know, 300 million sounds like a lot, but it falls short and it sends a clear message about their priorities of this government. Who would rather give billions of dollars of tax cuts to large corporations, the oil companies, the big banks, or the well-connected wealthy insiders, rather than lifting every men, every man and woman who built this country out of poverty. It's not just the seniors in my constituency who are actually concerned about this, about the lack of support to lift seniors out of poverty. Many of the working adults, the young families in my constituency, are also worried because they're concerned about how they're going to be able to afford to help their mother or father have a dignified quality of life as their current OAS or GIS payments don't go very far. Since the financial support is not enough for their parent or parents to live on their own, these young families are turning to bring their elderly parents into their homes to care for them, to live with them. The cost of nursing homes or retirement homes are way beyond the reach of the people who live in my constituency. They can't afford it. And they're very concerned about the additional financial stresses as family caregivers when they're already just scraping by on their own. The seniors I spoke with during the morning walking club at the Malvern Mall, they tell me of their experiences of living with their children, how they feel like a huge burden on their children and feel guilty to turn to their children for support for all matters. They want to be not so dependent on their family members but don't really have a choice and spend as much of their days as possible in the mall so that they are not in the way of their children's lives. They don't want to feel like a burden. We owe our seniors so much more than this. We owe our seniors so much more than for them to feel like burdens. We, the NDP, proposed a 700 million increase to the guaranteed income supplement. An investment that would have allowed our seniors to live with a decent quality of life and would have lifted every senior out of poverty. This support would take the worry off of our families and allow our seniors to a retirement with dignity and financial security. However, as we know, this Conservative government has agreed to spend only $300 million, not even half. I know that the member from uh, other members in this House said oh, they're half measures. They're actually less than half measures. I guess it's okay for this Conservative government to lift three-sevenths or 40% of seniors out of poverty, or to lift every senior 40% out of poverty. Still, 300,000 seniors are living below the poverty line. Once again, Mr. Speaker, we owe our seniors much more than this. A recent report by the Calden Institute for Social Policy states that the increase in senior poverty is largely due to the deteriorating position of single elderly women, whose poverty rate jumped from 14.5% in 2007 to 17.1% in 2008. That's over one year. The federal old age security, the OAS, and the GIS assure a basic level of income for these seniors. This Conservative government displays, I'd like to say, a bipolar approach to the help that they provide to the Canadian seniors. One of its policies has marginally helped the low-income seniors, only 40% of them, like I said, like I mentioned before, and the other helps the wealthy. In their maiden budget in 2005, the Conservatives announced a modest improvement to the GIS for low-income seniors. I thought there might be a glimpse of hope. But very quickly, they made a 180-degree turn, and the treatment of our seniors changed and the treatment of our seniors by changes to the tax system. Mr. Speaker, you may hear some of our members across the way speaking about their income splitting plans and how good they are. But studies show that pension, splitting, pension income splitting does absolutely nothing to help single seniors or even the poorest elderly couples who pay no tax. Some, I clearly am at one minute, so I'm going to jump to uh, this part where I talk about um, racialized and lower income youth today, 
have, ac have difficulty accessing post-secondary education because of the barriers to education financially and otherwise. And we know that we need good post-secondary education to achieve any type of good jobs. And if our youth today are not having good jobs, they're not going to be able to save for their future and are going to continue to, more and more people are going to continue to retire into poverty.